Um, let's start with a quick introduction. Um, I'll start with uh, some of the people that you will probably meet during your studies here at TUM. One of them is my colleague Anja Hoffmann. And he is responsible for pretty much everything related to administration of the master's programs. So whenever you have an administrative question or some administrative tasks to be carried out, um, Anya is probably one of the persons you can speak to. Uh, the other person you can speak to is myself. My name is Michael Ritter. Um, I'm the secretary to the examination board in mathematics. So for any questions, uh, any issues related to general examination regulations, you're welcome to contact me or Anya anytime. We do have uh, a common email address. You can always reach us at master at ma.tum.de. We also have consultation hours currently um, on Thursdays, Thursday mornings, um, both on site and online, whichever you prefer. Um, the up to date schedule for that can always be found on our website. You'll just look it up there. And there's also the access data for the online meeting if you prefer to do that. In addition to general questions, you might also have some more specific questions related to your specific study program. For example, which modules should I choose to achieve this and that? In that case, of course, you can also try talking to us, um, but the better option is probably the study advisors. There's one study advisor for each of our master's programs. Um, so depending on which program you are enrolled in or are interested in getting into, uh, those are the best persons to talk to. And let's start with, oops, start with the uh, math master's program. The study advisor for the math masters is Frank Himstedt. Then there is the data science program. The study advisor for that one is Peter Masopust. The math finance program, Alexei Min is your study advisor. Um, and Alexei will join us later. So if you have any specific questions about that, Alexei will be here. And I think some of the others will also be here later for the get together. Um, then there is uh, science and engineering. Your study advisor is Rainer Kallis. And there is also mathematics and operations research. And your study advisor is René Brandenberg. So for more specific questions, contact the study advisors. Uh, for more general questions, contact us. If you don't know where to turn to, you're welcome to just contact us and we'll forward your question if necessary. Um, and if you have a question that's not related to study regulations in, in any more or less specific way and you don't know where to turn, the info point is always a good address. So um, these three ladies here will be able to either answer your questions right away or at least direct you to the right persons to speak to. Um, Anja Hoffmann is also part of the InfoPoint team. And then there's uh, also Silke Brandenberg and Nina Meyer. The InfoPoint also has an email address, so you can either contact them in person during their opening hours, or you can write an email to infopoint at ma.tum.de. The opening hours should be posted outside of the InfoPoint, right? And also on the website. Okay, so those are the people you will probably talk to at some point during your study program here. Uh, we do hope that you will also find a chance to spend one semester at some university abroad. And in that case, um, there is another bunch of people you want to talk to, and that is our international office. Um, if you plan to spend a semester abroad, the most important person is probably Carole Jumpertz here. She's responsible for the outgoings, so she will be able to give you advice on which program to apply to, which university to go, how to structure your studies there, and, and everything related to going to some other university for one or maybe two semesters. Those of you coming to TUM from abroad will probably also have met Julia Solak already. So she's responsible for the incomings, people coming to TUM. Um, so if you have any questions as an incoming, any issues you're dealing with, um, Julia has probably seen that issue already and has probably some good advice that should help you there. And finally, there's uh, Angela Puchert. Angela is mostly dealing with recognitions. 
Um, so when you need to have an agreement, a learning agreement signed for your Erasmus exchange, or when you're coming back and want to recognize some of the modules that you did while studying um, abroad, then Angela is the person to talk to. Again, there's an email address, international at ma.tram.de, and there's a website. Uh, that's the old website uh, that will probably move in the coming weeks, uh, but I don't have the uh, new address yet. Good, so let's talk about uh, the structure of your study program a little bit. Um, most of what I'm going to say is the same for all of our study programs. I'm going to point out differences if there are any important differences, but of course uh, you can always look up the details in the study regulations and I'll let you know where to find those later on. So first let's talk about credit points. For those who did their bachelor's program in Europe or in Germany, you probably already know that system, um, but it might still be a good idea to recap the most important points. Um, so for each module that you can study, a certain number of credit points is assigned to that module. And those are earned through passing the examination usually. For some modules, there are additional requirements, um, but mostly it's just the examination at the end of the module. So once you pass that, you earn the credit points. If you fail that, you don't earn any credit points. One credit point generally corresponds to about 30 hours of workload. And that includes attending the lectures, that includes doing the homework, self-study time, studying for the exams, and also doing actually doing the exams. Um, so all of that combined, um, one credit point means about 30 hours of work to be invested during the semester. Just that you have an idea of how much work you should expect to spend for a certain module. One semester consists of usually 30 credit points. So the idea is to earn 30 credit points per semester to get 120 in total over four semesters. Of course, you can vary that a little. You can do a little less in one semester and a little more in another semester. Um, that's up to you. But as a rule of thumb, you should aim for about 30 credit points. That's the expected amount. And that should also be a decent amount of work that can be managed in one semester. And of course, that means you have to spend around 900 hours of work during the semester. Um, and well, most of that work naturally occurs during the lecture phase and the examinations. So there's also some work that you can do during the lecture free time in between semesters and the semester breaks. Um, uh, but that will usually mean, well, the idea is to have about a 30 hour workload per week. Um, but due to the concentration of work in a shorter amount of time, that naturally means you'll have some more work to do during lecture time and hopefully less work to do during the semester break. Right, so the semester workload that uh, corresponds to about 40 hours of work if you assume you work six months per semester. And that is, of course, not usually the case. So here we have a general timeline of your study program. Already said, um, you should do around 30 credits each semester. The expected study time would then be four semesters for your master's programs. Just in case you have any prerequisite courses, I'm going to give you a few more details on that later. Um, you'll have to do those in addition to those 120 credits. So the credits you earn through doing the prerequisites do not count towards your program. Um, and you have to complete prerequisites in the first two semesters, or more precisely, in the first year of studies. Again, more details on that in just a minute. You need to do one seminar during your study program. Most people do that seminar in the third semester, because that's when you have some, have acquired some necessary knowledge to go deeper into one subject through few courses in that area. And that's just before the first semester where you usually do your master's thesis. Um, and the usual course is to do the seminar in the third semester and then the thesis based on what you did in the seminar in many cases. That's not a strict requirement, but in most cases people do just that. Then there is uh, an internship that's mandatory for most of our programs. Um, usually you do the internship sometime during the semester break. 
Uh, the duration is uh, four weeks for most programs and six weeks for the data science program. Um, after doing the internship, you also have to give a report on what you did in the internship uh, in the so-called internship seminar. There's some more specific relations on that. Again, more on that later on. You would usually do that sometime during or between your second and third semester, but you're free to plan that whenever you want, basically. And of course, I already mentioned you can go abroad if you want to at some point. Um, most people choose the second or third semester to spend abroad at some university. Uh, which semester works better depends on the lecture times here and in the chosen country um, where you want to go. It's probably best to, to consult with our international office way ahead of your planned stay abroad to make sure that all aligns well. Some more words on that later on. So let's talk about degree requirements. Um, of course, to complete your degree, you are required to collect a certain number of credit points from certain modules. Um, what is common for pretty much all programs is um, you usually need to collect 77 credit points in math modules and possibly minor subject modules. So for some programs, you have um, an obligatory minor. For some, you can choose to do a minor. Um, in total, you need to collect 77 credits from those. On top of that, you have the master's thesis. That is always worth 30 credits, one full semester of work. Then there's the seminar. The seminar is usually worth three credits. There is the internship and the internship seminar. And once you complete that, you will be awarded six credits for that. And there is interdisciplinary modules on top of that. Um, that mostly means things like language courses, soft skills modules, uh, general modules that are beyond the focus of your specific study program. You need to earn at least four credits in those interdisciplinary modules to complete your degree. Right, so summing up, that should be exactly 120 credits. And that means your program will be completed once you have earned those 120 credits. Things are a little different for data science. So for those of you studying mathematics in data science, let's look at this uh, chart here. So for data science, there are two compulsory modules you have to complete. And those are the foundations in data analysis and the foundations in data engineering. One is taught in the winter, one is taught in the summer. Um, so for the first two semesters, you usually do one of those in each semester. Each is worth eight credits. So that's 16 credits worth of compulsory modules. You don't have to complete them in the first two semesters, but of course the idea is that these will provide a foundation for other modules, so you should complete them in the first two semesters. <clears throat> okay, that leaves us with uh, 53 credits in math modules and computer science modules. So in data science, there's a catalog of math modules and computer science modules in different sections. Um, and in total, you need to earn 53 credits from that catalog. There's no specific minor here, because more or less it, it integrates math and computer science. Again, you do a master's thesis with 30 credits. Again, you do an internship, but as the internship is longer, you also earn more credits. So it's six weeks instead of just four, and you get 10 credits for that. Um, again, there's a seminar. Data science also has a different seminar. You need to work a little more in the data science seminar. Uh, but then you also get five credits instead of just three. Um, and then there's the interdisciplinary modules. Um, and there are two kinds of interdisciplinary modules here. Um, the first is basically something you're free to choose from. Again, language courses, soft skills courses, anything you like, more or less. You need to do at least three credits in that section. And then there is some specific modules that are concerned with social and political aspects of data science and you need to choose at least three credits worth of modules from that specific section. Okay, so that's six credits in interdisciplinary modules in total, but in these two sections. That mostly sums up the differences. For more details, 
uh, specifically uh, the catalog of modules, uh, the sections um, of the catalog and uh, specific requirements on how many credits you need to earn from each of those sections. It's probably best to look at your curriculum on TUM Online. So just log in at campus.tum.te. You should have an account there already. Um, and there you can choose to view your curriculum. You can see all the sections of the module catalog, the modules in that sections. Um, and uh, you should also be able to see the minimum credit requirements for each section. So for each study program and each section, there might be a specific minimum credit requirement in addition to the totals that I've just given you. You can also access the module handbook from TUM Online, and that gives you a description of uh, what to expect in that module, of the contents um, of the examination. Is it an OR examination, a written examination? How exactly is this going to be conducted? How long does it take? Um, also um, about uh, when the module is usually read. So is this a summer semester module, a winter semester module, or is it on an irregular basis? So maybe it's not offered each year. Um, that should be available in the module handbook. There's a small book icon right to each module and you just click on that and you go to the module handbook and can read up the more detailed description. And of course you can also register for courses. So you can do that on Tom Online. Um, as far as examination regulations are concerned, there is no requirement to register for a course. Usually, if you register for a course, you get access to some course materials on our e-learning platform. So it's advisable to do that, but you don't have to do that to take the exam and earn the credits in most cases. Uh, in some cases, there's also a registration for uh, tutorials. So if you want to attend a tutorial, then you should also register for a specific tutorial group on Tom Online. Uh, the details on that will usually be told in the first lesson um, of the course. So that, that is different for each course um, and how it's organized will be, the details will be given to you by the professors usually during the first lesson. Right, so we've uh, briefly talked about exams already. Let's see a few more details here. So most of the exams that we do here are in written form. That's simply because for most courses, there's lots of students in that course, and it's just not feasible to do that as an oral examination anymore. For the smaller courses, um, oral examination is the norm, however. Yeah? So small, more specialized courses, you might have an oral exam as well. Uh, in some cases, there's a choice for the professor to make, whether he or she wants to have written or an oral exam, he or she will tell you usually by the beginning of the lectures. Uh, occasionally, there's either no specific examination at the end of the semester or there's additional work to be done. Again, the professor will give you the details and they should also be on the module handbook. So in some cases, you'll have to do a presentation, homework, project work, things like that. Uh, either in addition to the exam or instead of the exam. Um, all of that may differ for other departments. So what I'm telling you is mostly true for the math department. Um, other departments handle some things a little differently. So if you take in modules in your minor or if you're a data science student and are taking computer science modules, um, again, just listen to what the professor says during the first uh, lessons of the course and uh, he or she should give you all the details there. So I just told you that course registration is not necessary, but of course uh, recommended. For exams, registration is required. So if you want to earn credits for a course, you need to register for the exam, and then of course take and pass that exam. The registration period uh, this semester should open May 22nd and close June 30th. Usually registration starts around mid-semester um, and goes on for about six to eight weeks or so. Uh, please make sure to register before the deadline for all the exams you want to take. Late registration is usually not possible. Um, there's also a retake exam for most courses, specifically for all the math courses. 
So in case you can't make it to the first exam date, because maybe you're sick, or maybe you have another exam at the same time, or, or maybe there's some other scheduled date that is so important that you just can't make the exam, then there's usually a retake, a second chance to pass the exam. Um, examination period is usually after, right after uh, end of the lectures for about three weeks, and then the retakes are before the next lecture period starts for two to three weeks. Right, so you do have the semester break to learn and prepare in case you fail the first exam. Um, if you need to do a retake or want to do a retake, there's a separate registration for that. That usually starts sometime after the first examination period is, is over, so that you know your grades for that. Yes. So the question is, do you have to register for the first attempt to be able to register for the retake? Uh, the answer is no. You can just register for the retake if you choose to do that. That's fine. Um, and because the question is often asked, uh, on your final transcript, only the exams that you've actually passed will show up. So exams that you failed for whatever reason will not show up on your final transcript. You will be able to see those on your curriculum in Tom Online, but they will not show up on the final transcript. So your future employer does not have to know about that. All right, uh, and one more thing, you can only do the retake if uh, you have not successfully passed the module already. So if you pass in the first attempt and think you can do better, well, you can't. The grade's final. All right, uh, recognitions. If you go abroad and take some courses there, um, or maybe you have already spent some time abroad uh, or taken master level courses there, or maybe you have already taken master level courses in your bachelor's and didn't use them towards your bachelor's degree, then it might, might be possible to use those for the master's programs. Um, there's different kinds of recognition. Uh, you can either do or apply for a one-to-one -one recognition in case there is a TUR module that is basically the same as the other module. Um, and that means basically your status will be the same as if you had taken the TUR module. Specifically, the credits will appear in the same section in the catalog. So they will count towards the same credit limits if that is an important issue. If there is no equivalent module at TUM, you can still apply for recognition, of course. Um, if the course is a master level course and if it's if it is, if it is a good fit for your study program, uh, it should still be able to use those credits towards your uh, degree. Um, in that case, we have so-called other universities containers for the recognition. Um, we'll tell you about the details whenever you need that and uh, when, when you know which modules might be interesting for recognition, just ask about that. So there's no specific deadline for the recognition of courses. Of course, you have to do that before you complete your degree program, um, but otherwise you're free to, to do that whenever you want. And of course, um, as it says here in the last point, you cannot recognize any courses that have been used in your bachelor's program already. Yes. So for this interdisciplinary part, um, there's no strict requirement that they have to be master level courses. They just have to be interdisciplinary, meaning they don't have to be a part of your study program. All right, let's leave it at that for recognitions. Again, for the details, just ask us, Anja or, or me or Angela Puchert, uh, whenever that time comes to recognize any courses. So that should mostly sum up all the more or less regular modules. Um, let's talk about some more specific, more special modules. I already mentioned the internship. Um, usually the internship should be some job that you do outside of research. So you can't usually do an internship at one of the chairs. You can't do an internship at a math research institution. You'd usually work at some company outside of the university. 
The internship needs to be at least four weeks long. Most people do more than that, um, mostly because companies are usually hesitant to take people for just four weeks. Um, and also because usually you earn good money during your internship, so it pays off to work a little more. For the data science program, you need at least six weeks of internship. Um, you can either do that, for example, during the semester break as a full-time work, or you can also do that as a working student. For example, um, work like one day per week during a longer period, as long as the total hours sum up to something that's equivalent to um, four weeks of full-time work. So that's also fine. After that, you give a report at the internship seminar. The exact requirements for that report are on the website of the internship seminar. So please look it up there before you submit your reports. Um, and usually you, know, you also need to give feedback for other reports there. I think that's still the case. So there might be some changes to that uh, in the upcoming semester. A, a few details might, might change, but the up-to-date details should always be on the website. Um, for data science, this internship can be replaced by a course that's called Data Innovation Lab. Of course, you can also take that course if you're not a data science student, um, but it will not replace your internship then. It can be used for credits in your course in certain sections. Um, so in the Data Innovation Lab, what you basically do is uh, you work again with some company or research institution outside of the university um, on some applied problem that came up um, in a small team of students and uh, you hopefully will be able to solve that problem, give a report on what you did, what you found out, um, and that will also count for 10 credits instead of the internship if you want that. More details on the internship seminar are on the website, I already told you that. Again, that website will probably move to our new um, web presence at some time during the semester, but we don't know when yet. Uh, seminar. I also give, gave a few details on the seminar already. Usually you do that in your third semester to then continue to do a thesis in the fourth semester. Some chairs require that you did a seminar for, with them before they will give you a thesis topic. Some chairs don't have a requirement like that. There is no formal necessity, necessity for that. Um, so if in doubt, if you want to do uh, your thesis at a specific chair or with a specific professor, uh, be sure to ask um, ahead of time so that you can plan that and maybe take a seminar with them before. The application for seminars usually happens at the end of the previous semester. So sometime near the end of the semester, um, there'll be an email informing you that uh, the list of seminars for the upcoming semester is now online on a website. Um, you can look through the seminars that are being offered and you can then apply for the seminars through uh, the so-called matching system. Um, if you want to look at that, matching.ma.tum.te, that's the matching system. Uh, you should be able to look at last semester's uh, courses if you want to get an impression of what that is like. Um, in that system, you can submit a ranking of your most preferred seminars. You can just submit an application for one seminar or for all seminars if you want to do that. Um, and then the uh, lecturers can do the same. They can rank the students that apply to their seminar. And the system will then compute a matching. So it will assign um, a seminar to each of the applicants from their list respecting the preferences of uh, students and lecturers um, as good as possible. All right, so that's the uh, seminar. We already talked about interdisciplinary courses, so I think there's not a lot to add there. Let's skip that. Um, I did talk about the TUM Data Innovation Lab already. Uh, there's a similar set of courses that are called the case studies courses um, on subjects other than artificial intelligence and, and data science. The focus of those is hands-on problem solving. So usually what we do is we work um, with companies, practitioners um, from outside of the university who have problems where math can be applied to solve them. 
Uh, and the idea is to work in small teams of usually three or four students to hopefully understand, model, and solve one of these problems. Um, so in addition to applying the mathematics that you've hopefully learned in your courses at, at that point, um, you'll also learn how to structure your project work. Uh, you'll learn how to work in a team, how to document your work, how to communicate in the team, and also, of course, to the outside world, um, meaning the people that are interested in your project from the company, the advisors from TUM. Um, and we're also going to try and communicate what great things can be achieved with mathematics to interested students um, and other people. So this is also part of the course. Um, there are case studies courses offered for discrete optimization, nonlinear optimization. Those are usually taught during the summer term. Uh, we also have life sciences, um, also mostly during the summer term. Um, and then there's case studies for scientific computing. And specifically for those doing the program in science and engineering, you have to do one of those case studies courses during your study program. For the others, it's optional, but of course, recommended. That's a great course. Um, for the science and engineering students, you need to complete one. It doesn't have to be scientific computing. It can also be one of the others. Um, for all those courses, uh, the intake is naturally limited because each team usually has just three or four people and we can't do an infinite number of teams. So there's a very limited intake uh, and there's an application phase before the semester starts. So usually by the end of the previous semester, there'll be some kind of information event where we give you some details on the course, on the upcoming projects and on how to apply for that course. Um, and then there's an application deadline way before the semester starts. So unfortunately, this semester, it's going to be too late to join one of those courses, um, but maybe you'll be interested in a year. <clears throat> All right, master's thesis. Technically also a module. As I said, the thesis is usually done during your last semester. So that should be the last thing you do in your study program, but that is not a strict requirement. You can also choose to do one or maybe two smaller courses while you're doing the master's thesis. Um, it corresponds to a workload of six months full-time work. And that means you'll earn 30 credits for the thesis alone. For doing the thesis, you need a supervisor who will approve your topic or give you a topic. Um, and that supervisor needs to be usually a professor from the math department. Uh, there's also some people who are not, strictly speaking, not professors at the math department who are licensed to give you a thesis topic. And there are some people outside of the math department that can also give you a thesis topic. Um, there's a list of those people available on the website. So if in doubt, just look it up. Um, for those of you studying data science, most of the uh, computer science professors will also be able to act as a supervisor. Uh, they just need to be approved by your study coordinator. Um, if you want to do your thesis in cooperation uh, with uh, some company, industry, or some other institution outside of TUM, that is possible if you can find a supervisor at TUM or at the math department of TUM um, who is willing to act as your supervisor and sign off on that. All right. <clears throat> so up to this point, we've mostly talked about how things should usually go if they go smoothly. Um, let's have a look at uh, how things might break, just to avoid breaking them. I've already talked briefly about prerequisites. So some of you might have gotten a prerequisite um, for their admission. If that is the case, it will be mentioned in your admission letter. If you have a prerequisite, then that must be passed within your first year of studies. And that's a very, very strict regulation. Um, and there's absolutely no exceptions and no extensions for that. Right? If you fail to pass the prerequisite, um, then this will terminate your program. Also, the credits that you 
earned for the prerequisite will not count towards your total. So you have to do those in addition to the usual workload. And that means if you have a prerequisite, um, then that should be your number one priority in the semester where it needs to be completed. Um, so I would do some um, fewer credits yeah. in other modules in that semester and really concentrate on the prerequisite. Um, as a backup, just in case, uh, if you might be in danger of failing that prerequisite, then it could be a good idea to apply for some of the other master's programs. Um, generally, failing that prerequisite means that the program that you are currently enrolled in will be terminated, but you can apply and enroll for other master's programs, also math master's programs. Usually prerequisites are given uh, for the more specialized masters, often in um, finance. And if that's the case, um, it might be a backup plan to apply for the masters in mathematics, so that if you fail, you will have a chance to enroll in the math masters. And then take all the credits that you have already earned with you into that new master's program um, and complete that instead of the program that you originally wanted to complete. I'm telling you this now because there are deadlines for the application that are way ahead of the start of the new semester and usually way ahead of when you know that you've passed the prerequisite. Um, so if you want that backup plan, you should apply early. And if you pass the prerequisite and all's good, then you can just not take the place and go on with your old program and all's good, right? That is especially important if you can only do your prerequisite in the second semester. Yeah, I said you have a year, so if you can do it in the first semester, you'll know after semester one whether you pass it or not, and you have one full semester to uh, find some other plan. If you fail the prerequisite at the end of your second semester, then your program will be terminated after your second semester, and you should have a backup plan ready way before that. Okay, so it doesn't hurt to apply for some other program, just in case. Um, how to find out if you have a prerequisite? Well, Usually it's listed on your admission letter like this, so that looks some, something like this here. Um, and uh, it should contain a sentence that reads something like that in German. Diese Zulassung gilt vorbehaltlich der Erfüllung von folgenden Auflagen. And then there would be a list of prerequisites. In this case, Wahrscheinlichkeitstheorie. That's one of the uh, prerequisites that you could get for the finance masters, for example. Um, there's also an English version, of course. The admission is only valid if the following requirements are fulfilled. And again, a list of modules. So that much about the prerequisites, yeah? That's the one thing that, that just cannot go wrong. In addition to that, for everyone, there's uh, what I call a fundamental module here. It doesn't really have a good name. Um, what that means is for each of the programs, there is a list of catalog sections, um, and you find the specific list in Article 38 of your examination regulations. And you'll have to pass one module from that list during your first two semesters. And usually that list is the focus of your study program. Um, for the math master's program, for example, it's all math modules, very broad focus. Um, for the OR program, if you enrolled in that, it's one of the optimization modules, right? And you should, you need to pass one of those in the first two semesters. That's something that I think should not be too hard to do. Uh, if you mention to spend two semesters, if you, if you manage to spend two semesters without passing one of the required modules of your focus, then you should probably think about changing to some other program anyway. Um, but strictly speaking, that's a requirement. The deadline is the end of the second semester, including the retakes. So that's always including the retakes. Um, and that's an example for this uh, Article 38. As I said, that can be found in your examination regulations. Um, and that's the one from mathematics. So that specifically lists the catalog sections here. Um, Abschnitte A oder B1 in that case. That's, that means all math modules. All right. 
Then there is something that uh, we call study progress monitoring. Um, and basically what that means is you need to show some amount of progress so that you will be able to actually finish your study program at some time. Usually you should do 30 credits per semester, four semesters, and then you have the necessary 120 credits and you're done. However, there might be cases where you just can't do that for whatever reason, and you might need some more time, and that is usually possible within certain limits, and those limits are set by study progress monitoring. So here's the usual progress, 30 credits, 60 credits, 90 credits, 120 credits after semester four. The study progress monitoring sets strict minimum requirements on that progress, and basically that kicks in after your third semester. So the requirement is that by the end of the third semester, you need to have at least 30 credits. You should be at 90, but if you have at least 30, then you're good, and you can still go on. After the fourth semester, you need to have 60 credits. And I hope you're starting to see the pattern here. After semester five, you need to have 90 credits. And after the sixth semester, you need to have 120 credits. And that means six semesters is the maximum duration of your studies. Right? So once you fall below those limits, then again, your study program will be terminated. And terminated in this case means terminated forever. No chance of ever getting back into that program again. Okay, so that's a very strict requirement. Um, there are ways to get around this requirement, getting extensions on that requirement, uh, if there are very good reasons that you are not responsible for. For example, if uh, there's some prolonged illness that kept you from studying for a semester or so, and you were not able to reach those limits due to that, then just come talk to us and we'll see what we can do. Right, and that's something that is generally true. If you feel you might be getting in trouble, if you feel something dangerous might be happening to you, then come talk to us as early as possible. The earlier, the better, the more options you might have. Um, and we'll see what we can do and what the best option for you is. And that brings me to this slide here. So again, if you feel trouble might be ahead, ask for help. We're here to help you and we're here to help you navigate um, uh, the uh, examination regulations. So if you want to know specific details, if you're not sure about something, or if you feel you're getting in trouble, talk to us. You can also talk to your academic advisors, of course, those are also there to help. Um, and if you don't want to talk to someone at the department, there's also um, TUM Academic Coaching. You can also talk to those people. They also offer courses on specific subjects, for example, on how to structure your studies, um, how to learn. So if you feel um, you need to learn more in that, if you feel you have deficiencies there, um, have a look at the offers they have. Uh, and feel free to contact them anytime and talk to them if you're getting in trouble. And then there's also uh, an institution outside of the university, that is the Munich Student Union Advisory Network. Um, and they have lots of advisors on specific subjects. Um, so not just if you're getting in trouble with your studies, um, but also if you have some other kinds of trouble, for example, concerning housing, or if you're getting in some kind of legal troubles for whatever reason, um, they are also able to help you at no cost and completely anonymous, right? So um, we will never know whether you contact them. And finally, there's also psychological counseling. So if you feel you need help there, don't be afraid to ask. Again, Student Advisory Network offers help in that way as well. And the TUM also has um, a list of uh, places that you can turn to if you need any kind of help. All right, so that mostly completes my presentation here. I'd say let's uh, switch off the recording and see what questions you still have. <laughs>